All right, you beautiful humans, this video is going to be a summary of all the testing to occur within this series. And to start things off, I've got the 14 inch M1 Max MacBook Pro with a 10 core CPU and 32 core GPU with 32 gigabytes of RAM and a one terabyte SSD. Now first, it does seem like the design is getting a lot of attention, and we're not just talking about that notch, but this design is reminiscent of the MacBook Pros from around 2013 that held onto that similar footprint up to 2016, and as we've been excited about getting back together because I don't really think it was us that wanted to break up. However, the ports are back, and we're apparently either in a much healthier place to welcome them back or in denial that they left us in the first place. And for those of you who really pay attention to design and appreciated Apple's move to go thinner, I'm sorry but not sorry to say that we've got some extra aluminum on this chassis, and I know that this might sting a little bit there, Johnny, but we're ready to get some work done, not just with the reintroduction of those ports, but we've got room for that battery that has to push this more powerful chip, and with more power comes the need for more thermal headroom, because at the end of the day, this is a tool and not something I'm going to be hanging on a wall next to my acoustic guitar or gently seated on my white sofa with the tree stump on wheels. And so with that work in front of us, this is what I want to reiterate here, friends. This video is a jumping off point for a series to be released because I'd like to really unpack more of what's under the hood when it comes to CPU and GPU intensive tasks, Blender, Xcode, audio, gaming, and of course accessories that I'm working with and testing. And yes, we will also have content for the video and photo editors out there. And I know the consensus is that every creator talks about video, but many of us do use these devices for said tasks outside of this platform. But I will make sure that we have a clear title or thumbnail so that you will just see you on the other videos because I do care. And I also don't want my sarcasm to overshadow my excitement about this device, but I have to be honest that if you didn't experience the M1 chip, then I completely understand your enthusiasm because this is a pretty massive leap. However, coming from the M1, this is a next step. And yes, I acknowledge it is a big step. And I don't wanna to spend too much time on the design, but first I would like to mention the IO. And I do think that even though they apparently stayed out past their curfew since 2016, we will just accept the fact that they are back where they're supposed to be, and we're moving on. And of course, second, the screen is just a chef's kiss. If you if you haven't seen, like if you've seen the M1 iPad Pro, then you know what I'm talking about. And I will spend a little more time on this when I'm reviewing external monitors. And last, it is nice to see MagSafe back. However, the magnet has decided that it is gonna win the tug of war battle straight on, but lifting it up or pulling it to the side or even pulling it down will release it. So if you've gone ahead and pre-planned your accidents, then trip or fall on that cord with intention. And it does, however, perform the same whether plugged in or on battery, which is what we expect. But I have been doing uh, things with this machine so far is in, in what we would probably refer to as an edge case. And so I'll be collecting additional battery life data and I'll follow up with that later. But for those that are excited about using this with Blender, I will run some additional tests. And if you have suggestions, please do leave them in the comments, but try to avoid using links as much as possible because YouTube may just auto mod it and then I'll just never see it. And so comparing this with the M1 Mac mini with 16 gigs of RAM, I really was able to play back classroom just fine, no issues. And of course this wasn't a problem for the M1 Max, but the render results I received with these initial tests were 13 minutes and 42 seconds on the first frame and that maintained as an average for several more and on M1 Max, it was 10 minutes and five seconds. And maybe you're probably expecting a more dramatic difference, although that's still a savings over the entire project and you may likely be using cloud rendering anyway, but in my cursory tests, and that's what these really were, you know, working with some of these projects, there didn't seem to be an issue. And I'm really looking forward to seeing like the improvements continue as Blender becomes even more optimized for this chip. Now, as we've all heard, the internal drive speeds are just ludicrous if I'm really like looking for a word here. However, as far as the Thunderbolt speeds on these devices, I have tested my go-to enclosures from Acasis and Fledging, and I will be broadening these tests in subsequent videos with some like pre-built uh, setups, but I ran some synthetic benchmarks that are improved over the M1 Mac However, a large folder transfer test resulted in almost the exact results when I transfer them like to and from the internal and external SSDs. And of course, I will be taking a deeper dive on these in an upcoming video so I can really get a better understanding of where the bottlenecks may be when we actually start really working on these drives. And all of the video workflows occurred on the internal drives themselves and the devices and the operating systems all of the software was up to date and exact. And so I went ahead and pulled some 8K red footage, although 
I have permission to work with it. I unfortunately cannot show it to you. However, I will be doing more work here with my own footage and I'll bring you behind the scenes as I have in previous videos so that we can kind of do a walkthrough on those together, but the results were as I had expected. So the footage was not converted for Final Cut Pro or DaVinci Resolve. And so there were no proxy files, no background rendering, and it was graded and there were some effects added on this 12 minute timeline. And of course, starting with the M1 Mac Mini, because I just wanted to get a little bit of a benchmark there, this was definitely a lot to ask, but it, it was kind of like, you know, it was like, yeah, hey, I'll go ahead and export this, but you may want to run some errands or pick up some sandwiches because it might be a while. And of course, there were drop frames trying to scrub through this timeline, but it did export in Final Cut Pro. And of course, uh, surprisingly enough, in DaVinci Resolve, it exported even faster, which I was pretty blown away by. And of course, the M1 Max didn't have any issues playing this footage back or scrubbing through the timeline at all. And those export times were of course significantly faster in both programs with Resolve still coming out ahead. And the memory pressure was at about 30% during the export for each of these programs. But here's what I wanted to highlight is that I wanted to use the free version of DaVinci Resolve just to show you what can be done and to really encourage some of you to like try it, it is so well optimized right now. And I will spend more time here and bring you in some workflows with various codecs and even that all too stubborn GoPro codec that some of you have reached out about. But if you were curious on what a regular 10 minute 4K multi-cam timeline with grading, LUTs and effects, like how that exported, I do have a couple of numbers for you as well. And I also know that there's a lot of curiosity about gaming and I'm just repeating myself here that this is where we need development support, whether it's running natively or in a virtual machine. And I had never played Overwatch, but I did load it through Parallels on Windows 11 and it did have its moments of having a tolerable playing experience, but the lack of driver support is what's causing this issue. And it's not necessarily the power or lack thereof of the GPU in my opinion, but I will certainly be addressing this and spending more time in upcoming videos for you. And I will continue to do some comparisons with the M1 to help some of you out there with that particular buying decision. But let me just summarize that the M1 definitely turned a few heads. And these latest machines are the ones that are now shouting out for those in the back, making it harder to not pay attention. So in my very short time with this device, I can see with more optimized software coming onto the scene, either running Windows via their 365 suite or running it on the machine through virtualization, although getting some additional support with ARM will only sweeten that deal, that we could start to pare down only needing one machine for our work. And that is if you're the one seeking out a Mac OS experience that's built on hardware that'll give you more output with much lower power demand than its x86 colleagues out there. And really this just brings me to the fact that this is a tool that is really hard to ignore at this point because we are starting to see that this particular hardware is gonna start pushing beyond the boundaries of what other hardware and software can do because other devices, like other manufacturing, can build around this device because hardware that requires so much to be packed into it, I mean, we expect so much from these devices that these tools will be even more equipped to then unpack it and translate it with such a small footprint that it's actually becoming more accessible to more people. Did you get that? That seriously sounded like an ad, which is not my intention, so I must be tired. Comment section below on your thoughts, and if you have resources for testing certain things in Blender or Xcode, leave those below as well. I'm also over there on Twitter. You go rock those beautiful faces, and I'll catch you right back here on the next one.